Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Your Voice Matters, the final one for this time at least. I'm Janet Bogo, I'm your moderator, and we've been collaborating for the last few weeks with Capital FM, Equality Now, and Better for Kenya, bringing you a series of conversations around sexual and gender-based violence, all leading up to the Generation Equality Forum, which by the time this video goes up, it'll be the final day, I believe, of this landmark moment that's taking place in Paris virtually and physically, where world leaders are going to be making commitments that we're hoping they will follow through on, We'll have youth activists and advocates, influencers, people from around the world gathering to take stock of 26 years since the Beijing Women's Conference, which again was an, another landmark moment that created a lot of progress. But why are we still here today talking about sexual and gender-based violence in the family setting, for instance? That's our conversation uh, for today. So let me introduce you to my panelists. Don't forget um, to use 1195, that is the national hotline uh, to report any gender-based violence that you or somebody you know could be experiencing. These conversations are also a trigger. It's important that you know that. So it's going to be a pretty heavy conversation, an uncomfortable one. If you're triggered, you may not want to watch it. We completely understand. But please also seek out psychosocial support where you can. And you can start by using 1195. But let me introduce you to my panelists and then we'll have the conversation. Right next to me, we have Jean Paul, who is with Equality Now, Program Officer with End uh, Sexual Violence, or the Program Officer for, Se for End Sexual Violence at Equality Now. And he's been here before, so thank you for coming back. And then we have Nice Wanjeru, who is an actress, a motivational speaker, an influencer. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. We have Mary Makoha, who is the director of REAP, an NGO working in Western Kenya that deals with issues of women and girls' rights. Thank you for being here, Mary. And we have Mariga Thuithi, who is a communications campaign consultant. He's very passionate about reproductive health and rights. Thank you so much. I think the first thing I'd want to understand from each of you very briefly is why you felt it was important to be a part of this conversation today, sexual and gender-based violence within the family setting. We can start with you, Mariga. Why I feel it's important <coughs> is um, it's a two-pronged problem. A lot of times when we are addressing violence, and especially people are addressing violence, people look at violence as an individual problem, and people treat violence as a personal problem to be solved within this specific context, but don't look at it from the bigger societal view, right? We've normalized violence in different ways in a patriarchal society, but also capitalist society. Violence is in many ways an acceptable way of solving conflict. And thus in many ways we're desensitized to it. And so that's why in many situations, again, we have a conflicting view of people viewing, for example, gender-based violence as an issue between two people. However, when it comes to like the state and how the state views it in many ways, the state views gender-based violence as an affront against the state and not against the individual. That's how the state, for example, can grant clemency and can use, uh, the, the state can ignore and do many of these things because it treats it as a, against the state, not itself. So it's a very contradictory view sometimes and I feel like it needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed primarily by men who are the main perpetrators of it. And that's one of the things that I speak about when I write about men's issues is that um, men speaking out against gender-based violence in two ways. One, because they're primary perpetrators, but two, because they're also in many ways victims mm -hmm. of gender-based violence, even if in many ways men don't recognize the violence that they go through. Wow. Sorry. And I, I like the point that you talked about the, how this, the state almost views it as a, a war towards the state. And in many ways, it then normalizes a lot of these issues that we see. Um, Mary, uh, you know, you've, you've been an activist in this space for many, many years. We were talking earlier about the number of, of cases you deal with. Um, and I know we'll go into some of the solutions within it, but just going back to the question I posed earlier, which Mariga has answered, why is it so important for you to be front and center in addressing issues to do with sexual uh, gender-based violence, particularly where children are involved? Yeah, um, I would say this is uh, very, very important that uh, we address this issue um, because Kenya has so many laws, so many policies, sexual offenses policy, um, our constitution, everything. Uh, but is that enough? What else do we need to do? Because with all these laws, with all these policies, this issue is still a very big problem. So my question is what else can be done? What else is there that is actually um, uh, fueling these problems. Is it like our law is not enough? 
is it corruption? Is it uh, these policies are not working? So we need like to sit down and ask ourselves, what else can we do? What else needs to be done? In terms like I come from um, a rural setting. You know, we have all these cultural components, we have religious components. How are we addressing all this to save our girls and women? Yeah. Okay, it's really important. Um, nice, what about for you? For me, it's very important. One, because I'm a mom to a, ch to a girl child. Secondly, I have that voice to speak to women. I believe that in everything that happens in the society, especially now we are talking about sexual uh, gender-based violence, I have people who come in my inbox, they tell you stuff, you don't know even how to answer them. I personally have not gone through that, but when they talk, I feel that as someone who has numbers that can talk to people out there, I also need to address it. It is a very um, tense topic, yes, very strong to talk about, especially in the society we don't talk about it. I don't know if it's a taboo, People, some other people think it's a taboo, but I am here to give that voice to that girl child, that no matter what, you need to speak up. It's not a matter of, <coughs> of your mom, society have these laws or religion have these laws. As a woman, speak up if it happens to you. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you and you and you. If it happened to me, then depression is the one that will going to kill me, not you, not you. So if I don't speak it up, if I'm not given that voice, if I'm not actually pushed by people like me to tell you it is okay to speak out, it will never be solved. Yeah. So this is my moment to talk to that lady, talk to that woman, speak up, to, do, to talk to that child that you as a parent, you need to do something. So that is why I'm here. Yeah, and that's important, especially I think a lot of the times people are so... You know, they're afraid to speak up. Where do you go after that? Which safe space has been provided for you post revealing that kind of trauma? Yes. Um, GP, you also, you know, deal with this a lot um, in, in equality now. And as Mary has mentioned, and we've mentioned many times on this program, we've used the sentence that Kenya is a poster child for some of the best policies the world over. Um, it seldom translates uh, to the ground. So, but you're here, you show up and you're constantly advocating for the same. Why do you think it's important that we keep having the conversations? Yeah, thank you, Janet. It's very important to keep on having this conversation because uh, in my 15 years of advocacy, especially against GBV, what I've realized is that uh, GBV has been treated as a private affair. So that, for instance, if uh, a young girl is raped by the dad or stepdad or uh, a wife is beaten by the husband, you're told, settle this at home. Yet, uh, this is a public issue. This is an issue which is now a crisis in Kenya. So then us as people who are in the front line working against GBV, we need to speak out, come to the public and let the victims know that actually you can speak and there's somebody who will listen. And that, I think that's the gap which has been there since 1995. And Beijing happily broke that silence that GBV is a public issue. It affects our economy, it affects our hospitals, it affects everyday output of the person who has been violated. So that's why I'm here. to entrench that and make sure that we make it public. Let's make it public. And I'm happy that when we speak about it, the bullies, yeah, they restrain themselves. And of course, some of them are jailed. We are happy we've jailed over 70 people in the last few days with Mary. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Well, yeah, we need, and it's funny you mentioned that, JP, and I'll bring this back to Mariga. We were just talking about why we don't name and shame, <laughs> you know, the, the perpetrators, ETC. But I, I want to pose a question which is, um, the uncomfortable and honest truth about a lot of what happens, especially if we're going to look at um, sexual violence committed, for example, against children within the family setting, um, whether it's Busia, as Mary has said, whether it's at the coast, because I've spent a bit of time you know, speaking to social workers at the coast, it is so widespread that you have to stop and ask yourself, who is normalizing this to the point where there's people waking up every day with the guts to still go and commit this crime. You know, because at the end of the day, the perpetrators many times are absolved. From what Mary and JP have said, the great thing is now there's a bit more momentum, especially after Praying Fathers, a feature which Mary um, was a part of. But Marika, can we speak to the uncomfortable notion of sexual violence, or so act of a sexual nature, being, um, especially if it's a man performing it, you know, against a child, um, there's the intimate partner violence, but let's talk about incest, brothers to their sisters, fathers and their daughters. 
let's speak to the uncomfortable notion as to why that is somehow uncomfortably normalized in a lot of our cultural and societal settings. Um, one of the saddest things I realized, I was reading up at some point about like GBV and the numbers, right? Um, over 50% of uh, sexual violence against young girls is done first by their fathers, fathers, brothers, then uncles and neighbors in that order, <laughs> which is absurd because most people won't be assaulted by a stranger. It's literally their fathers, fathers, then usually fathers, brothers, then uncles, either of the siblings, then neighbors. That's an absurd statistic, over half of them. So when, in many ways, we talk about sexual and gender-based violence, you know, it, it, people talk about this a really abstract thing. No, no, no. You're talking to your father. The, the guy right there watching it next to you, you're talking to your, if you have a child, you're literally talking to your sibling. That's who you are talking to. That's who you should be cautious about in terms of sexual assault. You're talking about sexual assault as a statistic, as a fifth, it's not 50%, 30%, no, no. It's this person right next to you. It's your brother, it's your father who's more likely to rape or sexually assault someone than any other. That's what makes it uncomfortable. Because two, three things come into play. One is patriarchy, which will in many ways have men protecting men, of course, but will have the women protecting their own men. And number two is economics, again, around patriarchy and economics, is that many of the women earn way less than men. And so in many ways, the protection of the men in these things is a very economic decision. Mm. And that's usually what happens, because many of these people say, fine, you jail this guy, and then he's a main breadwinner. So in many ways, I tell people, we don't, don't place the burden of morality on the oppressed because you expect more from this mother who is poor. You expect her to quote unquote, sometimes you say do the right thing. She probably in many of these contexts has also been physically and sexually abused by this man. And at this point is also at the financial mercy of this man. And so in many cases where we talk about the protecting, when you say that the mother sometimes protecting the husband, yes, she is, but the statement on its own sounds wrong until you look at context. She faces physical harm, she faces sexual harm, and without him, she faces economic devastation. And so that's why in many of these ways it's sensitive because when we start talking about GBV, it's not just about stopping violence in the home. There's so many other economic factors that lead up to it, and primarily it's just power differences. The power element in many ways is economic and physical. And so when you, the, there are elements around stopping it later on, but there are very many things around when you talk about empowering women and policies that ensure equal pay and equal employment for women, it starts there, it starts all the way back. So it's a bigger problem than just having, because you say people speak about it. People start to speak about it now, but in many situations, the complexity of the intimate nature of it, and now when you add on to other factors like the religious factors you had behind, the cultural factors you had behind, so it becomes a very complex situation, and I feel like it's very complex because it gets personal. It gets personal because if, you, if I tell you or talk about GBV, you'll say GBV is bad. However, if I tell you that the person you need to be most worried about is a person right next to you at home, then you keep quiet. Mm -hmm. If I tell you to talk to your brother and ask him about the boundaries he needs to keep with your child, then you, that, that starts becoming a very touchy conversation. Mm -hmm. When I tell you, tell your father that he can't do ABC with your child, or his, if your child's uncomfortable sitting on his lap, he shouldn't, that's not a conversation that's easily being held because it's... It, it touches a very personal nature of it. That, yeah, that, that really brings it home in terms of when you realize it's the person closest to you and nobody wants to, nobody wants to confront that uncomfortable truth and yet it's what it is. I mean, I remember we were talking earlier when, when Nicey was saying we need to listen to our children. Consent starts at that age. I'll never forget somebody saying to me, you know, um, when I was a new mom and they said, you know, when your child begins to tell you, when, when they're very triggered by a certain person, please listen to them. You know, don't go say, don't be rude, go hug your uncle. That's breaching consent, right? And I think in many ways it's having these uncomfortable conversations from a young age, which we can get into that is how do we have these conversations, right? Um, Mary, again, you've been at the front lines. We've, we've heard you when you did this uh, feature called Praying Fathers, which we'll, we'll try and leave the link because it's, again, it's a trigger and it's a very difficult feature to, to watch um, and listening to Mary you know, just go through accounts of different children who you've had to rescue, right? And then just based off of what Mariga has said, which is these very uncomfortable dynamics of why this conversation is so difficult. Let's take it back to you being at the front lines of having to confront this almost every day. 
Why do you think it's a cycle that never ends? We've talked about, you know, you just said this, this corruption, ETC. But when you, talk, when you talk to the men in the community, the women, the children, the court system, what is this notion that keeps this cycle alive? Um, I would say first and foremost, um, in Africa, uh, we have silenced the voices of our children. Because there is this belief that these children are liars. You know, so your child will tell you um, somebody touched me inappropriately and all that, but as a parent you respond, that is a lie. And mm -hmm. how can you cheat uh, or, or, or for uh, an adult? We have this like children are liars, the adults uh, tell the truth, which for me is the opposite. Adults are liars, children tell the truth. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. She's like, in case you didn't hear it. <laughs> Adults will always try to change the story. They'll always try to, but children will tell you the truth. But as parents, are we ready to listen to our children? You get a child is being defiled and you are telling her it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie, until the day an adult finds out. Then when now the adult tells the parent, it's like, oh, she had even told me and I didn't believe her. So parents have to start believing in their children. And you've seen that a lot with the work a you lot, do. A lot, a lot, a lot. You know, they normally come later and say, you know, she had told me one time, but now this time my brother found this guy. You know, that's when now you start believing. Uh, the second problem that we have is this thing called the family name. Yeah, the family name. Um, because uh, people have told me many times, like, if this case goes to court and all that, our family name will be tarnished. People will be saying, you know, we are this family that sleep with our children, with our relatives, among ourselves, you know. They call it inbreeding. <laughs> we are this family that is inbreeding. And because of that, so many bad things have happened. In Busi, I had an experience where a father impregnated the child, and when the baby was born, the baby was buried alive. Yes, the baby was buried alive to hide, to protect that family name. You know, yeah, so privately, a mother will know that her husband is uh, defiling the child. Relatives will know, but somehow it will be hidden. And I've seen this, uh, like when somebody is arrested, you hear the family telling the person like, we told you to stop. We to yes, we told you, meaning they knew. They knew, you know, they knew. But now they will be looking for that person who came and told Mary, who reported, you know, to deal with, okay? So for me, I think uh, this family name is a major problem. And then you get like uh, when there is uh, incest in the family, especially the woman is left in a very difficult dilemma to decide between her marriage and her child. And... I'm this person who says that we have overrated marriage. We have overrated marriage. It does not mean that if this husband even defiles the child that we got together, you know, I have always to protect the marriage because the Bible says God hates divorce. You know? So we protect these marriages so much at the expense of our children, at the expense of everything. Um, I've had so many experiences where Maybe a woman got children from another relationship, a previous relationship, and then she goes into another relationship. This uh, new guy, this new father, starts defiling your children, but you're too scared to speak about it because, one, they'll blame you. You know, it's you who brought this guy. Uh, number two, you are so ashamed to say that this guy is defiling my children, um, and yet um, I'm the one who brought him in the house, eh? Yeah, so you're too scared until these kids are defiled and defiled. We've had cases where a woman is pregnant and her two daughters are pregnant by the same man. But you know, you have kept quiet. I've seen cases where fathers have impregnated their daughters and the mother is the one who takes the daughter for abortion to hide the shame again, to protect the name of... It goes back to the shame yes. and the name yes. and... The name of the family. So this is happening and... I think it's just a high time we call it what it is and strive to stop it. Yeah, because whenever we've, right now I'm stuck with a girl in my house for the last, um, now it's 13 months. This kid was being defiled by the father from the time she was nine. She went and told her grandmother, uh, who is the mother of this guy. She went and told her auntie, 
But they told her, do not tell your mom. Yeah, keep quiet. Until now it reached a point where it could no longer be hidden. And when the child came out, um, she's been chased away from home. Yeah. Um, it's so hard. I, what's really sad is you, there's so many, there's countless experiences that you can, that you can share. Um, and I think that's what makes this, it, it's such a trigger. Um, again, whether it's Wusia where you work, whether it's the different spaces we've been, I'm sure even for you, is that there's countless, countless, countless experiences of, of children who are going through sexual violence and end up feeling helpless because the people who are supposed to protect you are the same ones saying you need to be quiet or you're lying. And so you're right about having these very difficult conversations. And I think it starts with whether it's these kinds of conversations that we're having on this panel, but translating that to the grassroots and to so many areas. And by the way, it's not even just grassroots, if we're to be very clear, it's, it's literally everywhere, right? Urban settings, um, informal settlements, wherever it is, um, it's, it's a really common issue. And so I think I was just, it always pains me when you, when you mention some of these examples, because to your point, Mary gets like, it's not a statistic, that's a child. That is a child who has had to go through that and have somebody not believe them. Um, nice, you talked about the fact that very closely linked to what uh, Mary has just said, we don't listen to our children. Um, talk to us a little bit about that as a, as a mom, your own experience with when that moment came to you, the realization about we really need to listen to our children. Was it through a certain experience or circumstance or is it just something that over time you began to really take to heart? When I, where I grew up, there is uh, nothing like talking about sex, about actually periods, about just being a woman. Is, we don't talk about it. And so um, by the time I wrote that post on my social media that you should listen to your children, I talk with my daughter. And most of the time, there are little things she will tell you actually when you're talking, just normal stuff, mm -hmm. even bullying in school. There's something maybe she hasn't even told that teacher. So one day she told me, that uh, uh, they used to be given desks, no, not the lockers in school. So uh, we were just random talks where I, I told her, nowadays you're getting angry, little things. She turned 10, so emotions have now started kicking. So I asked her, how do you feel when you feel that anger? Because at some point she doesn't want to be talked to. She just wants to, to have her time with the TV. And there are times that she's clinging. So, I needed to understand how do you feel? What do you feel when you you don't want anyone to talk to you? And she started explaining. Sometimes um, I feel angry when even someone just 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 maybe after you say hi once, where well you keep on hi you t don't mm -hmm. you know? And then I what do you feel inside? She started telling me I feel uncomfortable, and that is something she has never told me before. And I was like. Have you been feeling like this even when you were maybe in class one, class two? No, they are still now coming. Mm -hmm. You know, it's now maybe the definition. She's defining herself as a, mm -hmm. as a girl. And now it triggered me. And now she started talking, oh, when we used to share a, a table, even when I was sleeping, there was a boy each and every time he, he would tell me, Usinia kelem kono nitoe. And I would tell my teacher, but my teacher would tell me, ume complain sana pia wewe. You see? So I was like, how long has it been happening? And then she was like, ah, it's over because now I have a locker. Now I can be able actually to sleep at any particular time if I want to put my books wherever I can. And I was like, if I was talking to her from class one, actually the, the basic things of, of, of a child, like you listen from little things, or even some, some friends, they even, she even told, we moved to a different place. So she was like, this place, people are getting me. I have kids, we talk English, they listen. Where we were, she told me, kids were not getting me. I used to talk English and they're like, Sasa, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you see, that is something she had not told me when we were there. Mm -hmm. She didn't tell me that kids are treating her different. You see, and I used to push her, Chasha, stop staying at home. Can you, you're a child, get out and play. And then she'll go for 10 minutes and come back. I don't want to play. Kumbe, it's, those kids are not getting her. If, as women, as um, a father, a mother, if you're keen enough 
You listen to your children. You watch their behavior each and every day. You make them, you love them so much that the first, if something wrong happens, ata ile, ata ku skia jicho ile kitu sisi uskia, maybe unaskia jicho ina shake. They should be that, you should be the first person yeah. they tell. Mm -hmm. Not the neighbor, not the friend, you should be. And that was like, uh, these things happen because either you disconnected yourself with your children, mm -hmm. they don't know how even to start. Yeah. But if you do that from the time they are young, it is so easy for you as a, actually, yeah. even before they tell you, you will note, why is my daughter limping? Mm -hmm. Even before they tell you, why is she too quiet today? Why? Because you know your child, you know. I know my daughter is everywhere, everywhere. And when she keeps quiet, I'm like, eh, hey. Yeah, but the reason why I think your testimony is important is it goes back to what we're saying, yes. which is we need to we need to listen, right? Yes. Whether it's um, across the board, if it's if it's a man experiencing, you know, violence or a woman or a child, yes. I think the invalidation of, of victims is also what perpetuates this cycle. Mm -hmm. It's because a lot of the times there's a lot of gaslighting. You, you're made to feel like it's in your head or it's not really happening or you're lying. So it's important to take it back to listen from when they're really tiny. Also, yeah. As much as you will listen, mm -hmm. I will not come to talk to you even if you will listen, mm -hmm. if you do not have a relationship. Right. Yeah. It mm -hmm. is so hard to talk True. to a stranger. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I, they talk to you, you're a stranger, more mm -hmm. than their parents. Right. Because also, as you listen, be observant. Mm -hmm. If this is your friend, or it's a neighbor's kid, if you make friends and you show them, I'm a good auntie, trust you me, you will not even slight, mm -hmm. slight, slight behavior. Even before they talk to you, you will be the first person actually to, to approach them and ask, why are you like this? Mm -hmm. What is happening? Is everything you okay? Can make them open up. Yeah, and I think it's providing just a safe place that even if it's not necessarily the parents, because unfortunately in many times it's maybe a guardian or a yeah. friend, yes. it's just can we learn to create safe spaces for people to feel like they can be heard? Because yes. a lot of the time that doesn't happen. Marigo wants to say something. I want to give, <laughs> yeah, hold on. I'll Let just add a, a very tiny thing. Yeah. One of the things we take for granted is we don't view children as human beings <laughs> yeah. we, it's a very that's it's a true. very pe we make a very big distinction and yeah. that's for example in it comes to smaller things like consent that's why it, we don't think that mm -hmm. any of these things actually apply to children if you view children as human beings as opposed to what sometimes we call mini versions of ourselves or things like those really they're human beings with feelings with rights with boundaries which sh you should respect irrespective of their age. Hundred percent, right. And like what Nice is just saying, I found it so funny sometimes in Busia when I'm the one calling a parent because the child has trusted me to come and tell me she's being defiled. So I'm the one calling the parent to ask her, like, are you aware this is happening to your child? Yeah. Are you aware this is happening to your child? And the mother goes like, she has never told me. So you ask like, why has she never told you? Yeah, mm -hmm. are you even available? Are you even there? Yeah, we had this girl who was pregnant and it's like, when I called the mother to ask her, are you aware? She's like, no, you know, I leave very early to go and collect my fish at the lake and I come back very late. So like for four months, this woman had never really seen her child. You know, yeah. yeah. You want to respond? I want to respond and just to say that uh, it doesn't really matter whether the parent is there or this is a child. We are protected. And I love what uh, Mariga and uh, Nice and of course uh, Mary has also brought up, the personal space. And that's why we have the constitution. It actually protects that personal space, whether it is a child or an adult. Yes. And then now when you go to the specific laws, like now the Sexual Offences Act, which basically says that beyond uh, the rape, beyond uh, the sexual penetration, even just the touch. Yeah. For instance, uh, if any body part, any of your body part touches the body part or the sexual organ of the child, who is your niece, who is your stepdaughter, and here we are talking about the anus, the breast, yeah, the bosom, we are talking about uh, the vagina. So you have those things, that these acts which start, and you look at them and uh, people condone, but then this is what now graduates to, to the real violation, which now mm. you realize, oh, my dad has been raping me the whole of my life, and that's why I can't associate in the family. And then now when you talk of the issue of consent, it is not the small thing, it is the thing. There, there is nothing else. In sexual offenses, there is nothing else, the consent. And this consent is for the adult and for the child. And especially now when we talk about these violations within the family, it is even worse because uh, 
beyond that being a child that she's not able to consent, there's that aspect of relationship. So that's why we are very happy that our law is really bringing this out, but unfortunately our society somehow closes it back mm -hmm. and takes it back to the parent and say, oh, the parent has not been there, the mother has not been there, uh, they are not being taught this in school. But this is, this is out there. So the bottom line is that uh, the consent is the thing, and then uh, let, uh, let us not put uh, the duty, for example, on the child to speak or mm -hmm. on the mother to take care of the child, on the father. This is, it is protect, it's a criminal offense. Mm -hmm. You touch a child's breast, you touch a child's vagina, you touch a child's buttock, that is an offense. Whether the parent was there or whether, because in some cases, as uh, Mary has rightfully put it, their uncles maybe will, will want to hug you and your parents like, yeah, just hug him, mm -hmm. he's the eldest in the family. But that is an offense already. So you are actually an accomplice. And if this was to be taken forward by people like us, then even you, you'll be prosecuted. <laughs> well, it's good that you brought that up in terms of how the law applies and how I think we're, we're blind to exactly what it means. So we'll take a short break and come back to how we begin to scale these uncomfortable conversations, even within the home, um, and what needs to be done. Because I, I do feel it could be wrong. I feel like there's, there's momentum right now in terms of people wanting justice. Sometimes my concern is there's momentum because it's a season of these conversations and then we all go home and, you know, we all forget. So we'll, we'll come and kind of address from all your points of views. How do we actually escalate this so that we just have a society that's, that, that's safer, really, for everyone? So we'll be back after this break. Welcome back to the second half of this conversation. Uh, the hashtag is Your Voice Matters. Hashtag act for equal as well. Today we're talking about sexual violence within the home, in the family setting. And Jean-Paul, let me throw this to you. Take us through the different types of sexual violence that um, happen within the home. Thank you very much, Janet. So I just want to make two general statements. One is that uh, anything that is a crime out there, it is a crime within the family. So that is the bottom line first, that uh, anything, especially it has a sexual connotation and it is a crime out there in the public, it is also a crime in the family setup. That's number one. And then number two is that uh, now the law specifies certain types of crimes within the family because of that relationship, the domestic relationship that exists in the family. These are poor living together. There's some level of power leverage, like he had mentioned. One, probably the father is providing economically, so there's that power that yeah, he can get away with certain things. So that there's that protection offered to people who are vulnerable in that sense. So there you find a child, for example. It could be the daughter. It could be a stepdaughter, an adopted daughter. It could be a niece living within that setup. So then there's that special protection provided under what we call incest, that if, for example, the male member of the family, either the father, the brother, the stepbrother, the uncle, has sexual relation with this girl, then it becomes what we call incest. Of course, when you hear the term incest, it is not a good, uh, yeah, a positive term. But it can also be um, a mother towards a son, exactly. right? It can also be the... Now, that is the converse. When you look at now the, the Section 20 of our Sexual Offences Act, that's now where it says that it can happen also if you are a female person to the, now the male children. But of course, looking at the statistics that we've been seeing and the cases we are receiving, the truth is that uh, the perpetrators are male. Uh, very few cases you'll find where the perpetrator is a female. And then uh, this goes because of the issue of the power, because in most of our family set up, especially in Africa, you find that the male uh, member of the family tend to have a lot of power economically, of course physically in some cases, most cases. And this power relation is what uh, in some cases drives this, uh, this kind of uh, impunity that this person can get away with this. This is how our father is providing for us, so he did this to you. Then people tend not to believe you because you're powerless, you're vulnerable. And then the other crime which is there is the attempt of doing that. Like, for example, if you, the father attaches the girl in any of the organs that have been now specified in the act. Like, for example, the act specifies the buttocks, the act specifies the breast, the act specifies the anus, the vagina. All these are classified as genital organs. So if any, because, and these things, we know them. For example, if somebody touches you, there's a touch that personally you'll tell, I'm not comfortable with this. And if you look closely, you'll find there's a law that protects that. That's the magic about it. That if something happens to you and you're not comfortable with this, you look at it closely and look at the laws, you'll find there's a law that protects you. And that's where it starts. So that, for example, if this father or uncle, in a way, touches you, and you can observe this somebody hugging someone, and you see, or you are, if you are, the, you are the person being hugged, and you feel you're not comfortable, mm -hmm. look at it closely, you'll find there's a law this person has uh, infringed, and an action can be taken. So those are the main two types. What about intimate partner violence or sexual um, assault from child to child? 
Yes, this one is also there. Uh, we've been doing the revision of the Sexual Offences Act. Of course, you remember a lot of debate on the Romeo and Juliet clauses where there was uproar that uh, the Sexual Offences Act had very stiffer penalties for boys, so to speak, which uh, is not really scientific when you look at the people in jail. <laughs> they're not boys, they're men. <laughs> yeah, they're not boys. Let's clarify that. They're men. But uh, because of our system and because of our society, uh, sometimes when something is blown off, the truth never comes out. So what happens is that uh, the violation that might happen, for example, between a boy of 17 years, a girl of 15, or uh, a girl of eight or 17 and a boy of 15. So there is a provision in the Children's Act that provides of how these cases can be handled. That, uh, for instance, both of them, of course, have committed an offense because anyone below the age of 18 in Kenya is presumed, so to speak, not to be able to commit uh, a sexual intercourse, to not to be able to have sex. That is a legal presumption that if you are below 18, you cannot engage in sex. But the reality is that we know that uh, there are people who are at 16, at 15. We, we, the other day I was reading newspapers and there was a girl at 11 who had a baby. So the reality is that it is happening. Uh, these young people are having sex. But then there's a provision in the law that if in such a case happens, then there's a way it is treated that these are vulnerable children who need what we call protection and care, both of them. But then uh, this is not really defined. That's why we are reviewing the Sexual Offences Act so that this can be anchored in the law. Because for now, we are relying on case law. So for example, today, if a judge at the High Court says that a, a boy of 17 years had a sex with a girl of 15 years, and therefore, we are referring them to the children's department for them to be counseled, for them to be investigated and just find why did this happen, what is the environment they were living in, and how do we prevent this from happening again. So then a lot of magistrates will follow that ruling because it is no it's not yet put in the law. But these revisions have been made. They are lying at the Attorney General's office for them to be enacted. And it is something we are learning also from world over that... Uh, a number of countries are, are looking at that critically now because these are happening and the challenge with them in the court system is that uh, when it goes to court, sometimes getting to the logical conclusion becomes difficult because if the girl is already pregnant, the boy is still going to school and then uh, it comes in the issue of how to take care of the baby. We presume that this is a child, he is not able to take care, he doesn't have a job, he doesn't have income, he's not able to take care of the baby. So these are some of the technicalities that we are trying to address by reviewing the law. But uh, to sum it up all, it is an offence and uh, there is a provision in the law to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. But those are not the problems we are dealing with, honestly. We are dealing with problems where men of 40 years are raping children of 9 months. These are the problems we are dealing with. The others are just debates. Mm, yeah. That's what actually yeah, is happening yeah, exactly. on the ground. Yeah. And then there's also the intimate partner violence, which is between, you know, the couple. I think that's also the other uh, sexual violence that happens within the home. Um, between and the it is a very big debate. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Kenya and a number of African countries, we fought this. Uh, in 2005, we had an opportunity to anchor this in what we call the Maputo Protocol, to define that. A number of countries in West Africa have actually defined it, that when my wife says no, it is no. When I say no, it is no. Mm. It is a personal choice. It, and what we are referring to as consent, am I ready to have sex? If I say no, the other person should respect my no. Uh, marriage is not uh, like a certificate that now uh, I find you doing your work. There is that personal dignity that uh, I want to do this at this time. Mm -hmm. So that has been anchored in other laws in other countries, other countries, especially in West Africa, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso. They have it in their law that uh, if your wife or girlfriend says no, you respect that. And there's a way you can actually work around that until the person feels like they want it. Because at the end of the day, it is a violation. It's that personal space I was talking about, that the Constitution protects our dignity. But then our specific laws have not really defined all the, the personal space we have. Yeah. It presumes that once I have a girlfriend or I'm married, I get a certificate for eternal yeah. sexual mm. intercourse. Which is not the case. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's, yeah. it's not like flagging it off for that. Thank you for explaining that. So Mariga, based off of that, we have the law, as he mentioned, on the ground is totally different. These conversations absolutely need to be happening. Like I said, if my friend hadn't really pointed out to me that that was, that we need to encourage consent from a young age, and my sons are what, two and five, and now I'm so cognizant of it, that whenever they, they're triggered, I'm just like, no, you check your spirit. That's why he's not hugging you, or she doesn't want to be near you. So I get it now, but how do we navigate these conversations in the home? So one of the things I started basic level is listen to your children. Now, um, a slight disagreement on something he mentioned about like young boys. Young boys actually assaulted a lot. Now, let me tell you why. I deal with young men, right? That's what I do. Now, the difference is that when one of the biggest problems around research around GBV and many challenges in need to, it's how it's framed. 
GBV is framed as assault of a man against a woman. And there's a literal national study I've looked at two separate ones run by the government. When people ask the definition, that's exactly the definition they give. Mm -hmm. However, if you go beyond that and define what constitutes as GBV and tell him you could also be a victim, have you faced it? Then the, quest, the answer changes. Many young boys have faced sexual assault as their first sexual experience mm -hmm. from two things, from house helps. Mm -hmm. That's the primary avenue. I, name literally we sit in groups and many of these people literally half half of the co contact groups i go to with men the boys were sexually assaulted by their domestic helps and then when later on they get in teenagehood they're sexually assaulted by sex workers that's uh, something i think we'll pursue later but especially boys in high school when boys leave for high when boys leave um mm -hmm. their high schools uh, they go to sex workers that's rape that's not having sex it's rape that's that's the most common ways in which boys lose their when you call lose their virginity, it's rape. But now back to the topic about how you bring it up. It's one, listen to your children, to view your children as human beings, but three, just talk about sex. When people have been fighting sexual education, comprehensive sex ed for a while, because you know there are many stereotypes around. That it's fine. I find it really interesting, but sad at the same time. People think that you when you teach kids about sex ed, you're teaching them how to have sex. No, you're not. That's like that's completely not what you're doing with sex ed. Mm -hmm. It's teaching them at a basic level to define what their private parts are. It's teaching them about consent. It's teaching them about the dangers around them. Now, part of the complication about some of these conversations is that they affect us personally. I say, when you teach kids about consent, I hope you know that the consent applies to you. Right. <laughs> yes. right? You tell a kid that if they're uncomfortable with being touched, that they should speak up. I hope you know that applies to you too. This kid, this kid can bring up the same exact things to you. Right? Teach them about sex, have these open conversations, because only through conversations about sex do you teach conversations about consent. People, um, it's, it's a sad thing, and, but it's getting better. I feel like we're getting better as parents overall, because I feel like we, uh, in many senses, many of us get to start being friends with our parents in our late 20s into our 30s. Mm -hmm. right? That's when you actually have starting having real conversations. Mm -hmm. But your parents were shocked at some point because they're like, we don't have a really good relationship. This child doesn't talk to us. I'm like, yeah, yeah. you beat them all the time. That's all you do. You're beating them and you're shouting at them. Mm -hmm. Tell someone, if, uh, from an adult perspective, if every time you, you and I disagreed, I beat you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a different conversation. The ramifications would be very different. <laughs> so why do you expect? <laughs> Why do you beat children for 18 years of their lives? And by the way, there's a study that showed, I know there's been many, and I know we all in this room can be like, even I was be, but there was a study shown recently that it's actually retrogressive. Mm. But also tell that That's to African true. parents, also try. I mean, oh, I don't know, it's it a whole is. other. So you, you can't, parents have this conflict where they're like, oh, I'm so sad, my kid doesn't op open up to me, I'm not friends. I mean, no, no, if you look at, if you analyze your own relationship with this child, Anytime he speaks up, you'll beat him. You, and literally at this point, sort of slight spanking. People physically assault their children for decades and then are shocked that they're not close enough. Because when I told someone that, I told someone, if you and I disagreed and I beat you for the next 18 years, do you think we'd be friends? So you go to the police. Mm -hmm. mm. In fact, some of, your, some of your children should be calling the police on you. Mm. Like not even strangers, you're calling police yeah. on you. And so when you start having these discussions around sexual um, reproductive health, about sex in general, about consent, about all these things. Because some of these things will happen, right? Kids are statistically having sex from about 10, 16. Mm. 16 is six years too late. And so you think about that is that sex ed doesn't start at 16, you're late. Sex ed would probably have to start at eight. Mm. And it's an uncomfortable truth. Kids are having sex among each other. Now, as to the morality and these of these discussions, I still feel as, as long as children neither here nor there, you can talk to them, you can cancel them. It's not a criminal offense. People kids have sex. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a matter of bringing up all these discussions. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways you realize that one, in many of these countries where comprehensive sex ed has been done, is that one, the rates of childhood pregnancy have gone down, they've dipped. Because once kids have the information about it, many times it's, it's, you, it's very secret and very exciting and so you have sex, but many kids when get comprehensive sex ed tend to have sex later. Mm -hmm. And then number two, tend to be more informed and so in these societies, people speak up more and people listen to children. So it literally starts from you as a dad and you as a mom having these conversations, having yeah. the safe spaces, and for the adults around them to also be the same. Because sometimes in many situations, your kids might not be able to talk to you directly for one reason or the other, but you still have to have, again, back to 
a thing which moved around your community around you, the parents around you, these are the people who would tell sometimes more than that. They also need to have some of these conversations. I've studied with my nephews and nieces. I have these conversations with them. Mm -hmm. I know when I was talking to one of them and she's telling me, all oh, these boys of nowadays, now they're starting to sex us. You know, I kept quiet for like a second because I was scared this kid, but I kept quiet because I was, I, I don't know why I was shocked <laughs> that kids are sexting each other at 10. Yeah. But I'd, I'd, there's no judgment, just listen. Okay, what's he saying, Nini? And be shocked that the more you have these conversations, she's like, what's he doing? And this, the, the kids who are more empowered and talk to you and say, she literally took me through a thought process, what's he doing? He should be reading. I have things to do. He should go bother someone else. I don't want to have sex. And you realize that the more you give, and literally studies have shown, because people look at the carrot and the stick, and people look at the stick, if you beat this child, they'll be disciplined. No, actually, when you beat this child, you teach them that the only way they can be disciplined and have any good thing to do is if you beat them. But many times, if you let them, you talk to them, make their own decisions, they make way better decisions. They make decisions better decisions, overall. yeah. No, that's, oh, yeah, I, I mean sexting at 10. No, yeah, people don't want to confront the uncomfortable reality about that. Very briefly, Marika, before I move to um, Mary and Nice is also, and maybe Mary can also talk to this, is also having these conversations as a couple. Because remember, we're talking about sexual violence within the home, right? So we've talked about making sure that we can create safe spaces for our children in case there's an uncomfortable relationship with a relative or a friend who's older. But sexual violence within the home also pertains to couples, right? And a lot of the time, just like he said, consent is a thing that's thrown out as long as it's, there's a matrimonial agreement. Mm -hmm. So is there also space to say, as we are gearing up to get married, can we talk about boundaries? Is that something we need to be doing? Oh, yes, it, it, okay. is. it, it but, is. But, 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 but like um, in Africa, I know in my community, mm. we say that um, like when you've beaten up your wife, mm. you know, when you have violated her, like physically you've beaten her, mm. the best is to force her into sex to finish that. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Okay, so violate her, physically assault her, and then end it by forcefully yeah. having sex yeah, with her. Yeah, so have sex with her, mm -hmm. like um, it will finish up the match. It's like a dominance it's thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we have all these misconceptions. <laughs> just to and mention something, sorry, Mary, to cut yes. short, but mm. just to mention something, the misconception that we've realized in our work on that mm. is that it actually doesn't end the matter. It makes it an emotional violation. So mm. that the physical bit the woman have been... Yeah. This is the worst you could have done. Mm -hmm. And it is done with me physically. Mm -hmm. She won't fight back, she won't speak, but internally, she's... No, emotional abuse, which I think needs to be an entirely different conversation because, you know, a lot of people call it the silent killer, you know? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so that just sounds like exerting dominance to the end. Is that what it is? It is, yeah. it is exerting uh, dominance and it's like, um, and that's why you will get sometimes uh, when even robbery happens. This person will come, rape, mm. do all this, mm. <laughs> all these bad things mm. to you. It really puts you down. It's really like they are showing you that power, mm -hmm. you know, over you. Yeah. So sex is used as mm, like a weapon. Yes. In many ways. How do we create safe spaces, Mary? Again, with, with the work you're doing, um, you're even housing somebody to give her a safe space. There's obviously a gap with safe spaces, whether it's physically, emotionally, so how do we then scale these conversations to creating a safe space for people, children, men and women, who are all victims, to begin to find refuge and healing? Yeah, um, for me, even the fact that suddenly in Kenya we are talking about safe space, we are talking about shelter, it's actually a shame. Because it really shows that the community is sick. Mm -hmm. It really shows that our families are sick. Because uh, families, homes, our homes, our family setup should be the most safe place mm -hmm. for a child. Yeah. The fact that we are even thinking of removing this child from home to another place, it really shows how, how bad uh, things are. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to say that we should strive to make our homes safe for our children. Just like everybody has said, we mm -hmm. can do that by believing what our children are saying, mm -hmm. by talking to our children, by being friends to our children, you know, and by protecting our children. We are not doing that. Um, you get like in Western Kenya, we have this thing about holding relatives in the home. 
you know, you get like, you are a young couple, you have these young children, or you have children like uh, mm -hmm. that 10 year old yes. of yours, yes. uh, who is just now like becoming a little girl. But in that home, you are living with your brother-in-law, you are living with your cousin, you are living with the uncle to your grandmother and everybody. You know, every job seeker who is looking for a job, they just like mm. <laughs> come to your house so that um, your house has no privacy. People are sleeping on the couches, on the floor, everywhere. And you have these children at home. You know, um, I have, for instance, a case of um, um, this family where they had the herdsman, there was the brother-in-law, there was a cousin. The, there were about like five men. But again in that home, there was a seven-year-old girl. This child was um, abused her, huh? you know, she was defiled, and went by a brother-in-law to the lady of the house. When we arrested the brother-in-law, his defense was, I am not alone. I am not alone. Even the others have been doing it. And you know, we ended up arresting like five men. Same house. Yes, who lived together, defiling a seven-year-old child, and when we asked the child, she was like, yeah. You know, she was like, yeah, even so and so does it, even so and so does it, even so and so does it. Is this home safe for this child? So first and foremost, we must make our homes safe uh, for the child. It is so abnormal that today, like in Busia, I tell people, if your child is away from you for 10 minutes, you don't know where she is, you are likely to get her defiled. Mm. That is abnormal. Where are those communities where I knew that this is a nice daughter mm. and I can escort her home, I can ask her like, where are you? Where are you going? Mm. You know, where is your father? How, you know, where are those people? Are they all dead? Because today, he's my best friend, he's our family friend. He comes home, meets my daughter coming from the shops, from my home, then he defiles the daughter again. Knowing very well this is Mary's daughter. You know, you know. So the fact that even our communities are not safe uh, for children is just, it's a very sad thing. And um, today we are now talking about shelters. Uh, for example, I've had to bring several children from Busia to Nairobi who have been defiled by their fathers, who have been impregnated by their fathers, who have been impregnated by their brothers, all the way because we have no place to put these children. And that has also impacted on even um, uh, these children getting justice. Uh, because I have another group of very many children who have disappeared in the community without trace. This child who has been defiled by the father, and then you take the case to the police and all that. Are you expecting this father to be taking her to court? Mm. To speak, <laughs> to speak against him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet he's the one with the transport. Mm. He's the one who has the power. We don't look at the whole thing holistically. Yes. We don't, yeah, yeah, we don't. Are you only that. expecting like this child will come with the witnesses from the same house to go to court? And so many of these children, and that's why, because we have no shelter, I keep children mm. in my mm. house which is not even healthy for me. Yeah. yeah, it's not good. Legally, the children should not be with me. Mm -hmm. You know, and like, because there are no facilities, when you tell like the children's department, like there's this child who has been uh, defiled and they'll tell you, um, just to stay with her. Yeah, as we look around, there is no looking around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have faith that these commitments made recently, because the president did say, we're committing 2.3 billion shillings, and part of that is going to safe houses. Are you optimistic now, or do you still feel like, until I see it, I'm not sure? Unfortunately, until I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until I see it. Because we have promised all these things. Mm -hmm. Even our constitution, the policies that are there in Kenya are enough actually to protect these people. But are they working? Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned in the documentary about the police the court system, all of which, if they have all those loopholes, it goes back to affecting the child. You mentioned delayed cases. You mentioned files disappearing. Yeah. So that's still an issue? What happens, like in Kenya, we don't go by systems. We go by individuals. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm very happy in Busia because of this one chief magistrate who came to my, after that um, documentary, she actually took time, came to our organization, she met the children, and she promised that she will change that. What if she leaves? 
Because the previous one that we had had, had a case where somebody uh, defiled a child, he was given bail, he went out, he defiled too, he was given bail, he went out until like now when we went to the street. Now that guy has disappeared to Uganda. So are we going to work with the individuals or the system? Yeah, we need the system to change. We need the system to change. Okay. Yeah. Um, nice, as we wind up, um, you talk about platforms, and I know we, we, we say it a lot, use your platform, ETC, but what more can those with platforms do? What more can people who have, as you mentioned, the numbers or the voice, what more can they do to amplify all of what's been said here by Mary, Jean-Paul, and Mariga, so that in reality, that we, we begin to see a shift in the narrative. I think each and every one, whether you are influ an influencer, whether you are, as long as you have numbers, you should be able to speak up. You should be able to actually, let me, let me give an example, where you put, for example, I have numbers. I, I, if I put my daughter, there's a time it was her birthday, and someone, a man, comes there and says, Nieke haka. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Na kutafutia mahari. Not mm -hmm. for my son, for me. Yeah. And then, the funny part is, they, we will not have people like, you have numbers, I may mention you, I may mention you, you get me. We need people, after such a comment, to say, this is wrong. It should not happen. I said it is wrong. And I was like, shame on you. And there are women also, some are like, Ayi, hakuwa na nini, alikuwa na joke, alikuwa na fanya nini, alikuwa... You get me. So, if I have this platform, and there's a... When you have a platform, you should also go through other people platforms. That is how you will know. This person has uh, been defiled or they are speaking up. I should be speaking there also with my numbers. Don't say it's not your thing. I've also spoken to other influencers and they're like, hey, your kid, you're rape. See, see, it's not my thing. What do you mean it's not your thing? We, 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 we should be taking it as the society. Not because you have numbers or... Now social media has become a thing. Everyone is advertising there. If we talk about this uh, GBV each and every time, each and every time, like a week, give yourself twice, even two posts, just post and actually talk about the rights of women, the rights of men, because there are also men who are going through the same thing. If, you, if we be that, I am sure so many people will come to our aid. I feel like we are letting this fight be fought by lawyers, yeah. people like you. Yes, yes. You get me. I feel we are letting it uh, be fought by those we think they have the voice. I don't know how they should look like if you have that voice, I don't know. But I feel that as, as celebrities, as uh, people in the society, we should speak. Whether you have 2K followers, whether you have 1,000, well, you have, we should be speaking about these things each and every day because they're not, they're not stopping now. Mm -hmm. Even now, there's someone is, who is getting defied right now as we speak. So yes. if we say that it's only on Monday that it happens or it happens after three months, that is when I only put one, one post and talk about it, then who will take me serious? If I, as a woman, I, as an influencer, I, as a celebrity, I do not talk. Who else are we waiting to oh, talk? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are we waiting for? And it is so sad also, the religion. Also, we should, do, we should talk about it. Let us not use that to, to actually uh, chain our kids and uh, make them, oh, unaindanga kanisa, oh, unaindanga nini, we should know. Also, churches should do that. They, are, they should use their platforms. Because I feel we listen to the religion or to, to church so much than maybe listen to me. Mm -hmm. There are parents who have used that church platform as somewhere only where children can be, can be um, talked to. If your ch child does this, what's an impeleke kwa pastor? I've had ladies who say they have, they have lost faith in the, in, the, in, in the church because same people you go to talk to, Unamwambi, I've gone through this, my dad, this, yeah. this, ni, 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 ni. Mm -hmm. don't worry. The Holy Spirit has told me yeah. I should sleep with you and it will go away. And they will do it. They will do it. Mm -hmm. If the churches would actually talk about that and because they have very strong power in the society mm -hmm. right now, if they would also use their platforms 
trust you me so easy at a let me talk a little bit about aids if they could talk about sexual se sexual offenses um, um uh, cases even in church and talk to their children and talk even to the families it will be normal it will not be something at the oh my god konini pasta amesema ivo you, you see? Yeah. But I feel that we are not yet there. Mm -hmm. And who are we, who is going to take us there? Mm -hmm. People like me, people like you. Let us use our platforms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Nice is just reminding me of something. Eh? Um, and I'm sure we all know this. You will get like there is this grandfather, yeah? Uh, so in like, in our culture, grandfather calls uh, his granddaughters his wives. Mm -hmm. You know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they joke like my wife, my wife when you have a grandchild. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm so much against it today as I speak. Uh, today in Busia, I've had cases where a 74-year-old man has impregnated a 13-year-old. Yes, I've had a case where an 82-year-old man has impregnated a child. I've had a case where a man who was like getting this... Um, uh, pesa ya waze, this um, mm. cash transfer, he got, every time he got his money, he used to abuse little children. And it all starts with that joking, my wife, my wife, you know his grandfather is Kuka, that's how they are called in the village, mm -hmm. my wife, my wife, my wife, until now that wife thing starts being real. He starts touching this child. And the parents normally joke like, ah, kuka me kulete mkate. You know, kuka has brought you bread. Hey, your wife is coming for bread. Mm -hmm. I have told people that stop, stop, stop making that uh, your children get so familiar. Stop making your children get so familiar with these people. It is so abnormal that when I was growing up, we used to be told when an adult calls you, you run, put your hands behind, and listen to what they are saying. Today I tell children when an adult calls you, run. Run for your life. Look at that. But that's really sad. That's the situation. That's, that's really sad. Um, it's sad. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel I need to say this, that when we, we look at children as children, we may not actually know their problems. Mm -hmm. If you look at a child, as you said, as yeah. a human being, if you listen to a child, you will actually see the same emotions as a, hu as a grown up you have, mm -hmm. the same they have. Mm -hmm. You are expected, there are days you wake up and you have moods. As you, as you, 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 you're just you. You don't mm -hmm. want usinishike, you know, don't talk to me. And actually, you protect your space because you know what is happening. Mm -hmm. You are aware these are emotions. I should not show them to Janet. I should not so, show, uh, show them to Mary. I should not show them to this person because this is my space. Mm -hmm. Let me protect it. If you look at that child, the same emotions as a grown-up you have, the same they have, the same they have when they are angry. Stop telling, Kwanini una shout. Mm -hmm. Understand why this child is shouting. Because maybe she's having a bad day, yeah. maybe he is having a bad day. But mostly we do not want to take care of their emotions. We want them to be kids. You forget also they have that. Yeah, you want them to be picture perfect and happy all yeah. the time. They, they yeah, and it's, when, it's when, not realistic. Also when you call them and maybe, maybe mm -hmm. even they bang that door. Before you actually go and slap, maybe because she is 13, mm. she is 13 and 14. Una show nani utine japa. That is how parents talk. You know, ata mimi nilikuwa hapa na mama yangu alikuwa na nichapa. Before you do that slap, just ask, why did you bang that? Be afraid. That's been a hard lesson to learn. Like, I, I'm, I'm new in the mom game. I'm not going to sit here and be like, you know, in my 10 years, it's new. <laughs> but, <laughs> but these conversations have helped me a lot because I think, um, I don't know whether there's things I would project ETC. It's changed now with my son who's almost six. I, and it's changed the dynamic of our relationship. And I think that's what's really crazy to see is the approach of, let me hear you out. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy because, of course, there's a discipline thing that's needed, right? But I realized many times it stemmed from somewhere. That's for me what's incredibly unreal is, mm -hmm. you know, he would say things like, I was just a little bit confused about this thing that happened. I'm a little bit, he uses words like concerned, I don't know, and confused. And I'm like, let's talk about that. 
But I, I think it, it, and I know it's, it's, a, it's a minuscule example to much larger complex relationships that parents have with their children. I don't want to trivialize it because I think relationships are very layered and complex and we can't speak for all. But bottom line is your child is a human, so listen to them. Um, and bottom line is a lot of things that culturally were okay before, like the way Mary was saying, being called the wife or the husband. Back in the day, I'm sure they were, the meaning was, it, it was well-meaning. Unfortunately, it's just really been corrupted to the point where we have to be alert to it. We have to see it as something uncomfortable as opposed to this is part of our culture. And by the even as you say, Western, Western it's across cultures. Yeah. It's literally across cultures, not just in Kenya, I think in Africa, and I think in other parts of the world. Um, anywhere that's patriarchal, you, if you look deep enough, you'll notice things about blurred lines around consent, around how children are deemed when you're a certain age, when you start your period, you're not ripe for marriage. We just have to completely review a lot of these things. Sadly, they were well-meaning. Well it's no longer what it was before. And so, wow, with that, thank you all so much. So, so, so much for making an otherwise uncomfortable conversation a possible one to have. I think, I think the points you've all raised are, are very critical and I'm hoping that you can share this conversation in your networks as well because this is happening in our homes. In fact, as Mariga said, it could be the person next to you. It's uncomfortable, but it is what it is. So how about we step out of, you know, put, sweeping things under rug swept and say, this is uncomfortable, let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation about consent, about boundaries, about safety, about our community, in our, in our places of worship, wherever it, it is, let's have the conversation. Let's at least start with that. Let's move beyond it being uncomfortable and normalize it as much as we can. Because I always feel as, as long as we're not having the conversations, we're complicit in a lot of these issues that are taking place. We're saying it's not my problem, that can't happen to me. It can, it can actually happen to you and it's probably happened to somebody close to you. So remember to use 1195. We mentioned that on this program and on all our platforms all the time. I've used it, I've tried it just in terms of does it work? It does. A lot of people have said that they've been helped through that. So use 1195 because they take you to networks for, to where you are, in whichever county you're at, they try to connect you to the closest person, whether it's a social worker or a hospital, that can help you or your friend or somebody who is in need, man or woman or child. So 1195 is the national GBV hotline number. And remember the Generation Equality Forum, like I said, it would have closed by the time this conversation is going up. Um, but as we're putting out the promos for this, I'll also be moderating a global uh, conference on the action coalitions for GBV, commitments that are being made by world leaders and presidents and youth activists. So please make sure you try and watch that as well because this is the beginning of holding people accountable. It does not end here. I'm Janet Bogwa and together with Capital FM, Better for Kenya and Equality Now, thank you so much for being a part of Your Voice Matters. We hope to be back soon. In the meantime, you'll be able to watch a lot of the other episodes on the Capital FM page and across our social media as well. So thank you and we'll see you next time.